Police believe that there could be more victims out there. You can see how easy it is to remove a tailgate from a truck. In fact, they're meant to be removed. Now the wind is just still ripping through here and there are a lot of hot spots that fire crews are keeping their eyes on. Whoever started those fires used one of these, a road flare, causing potential danger to two residential neighborhoods. You're watching me on an extensive video surveillance system that captures everything that happens on this street. You could say the guy behind it is the neighborhood watch. As K2 investigator Hillary Lake reports, it was all thanks to social media and some keen eyes. I'm in Cannon Beach where all of this ended today. Someone saw Deviney walking off road near here and called police. When they approached him, he said, I'm the guy you're looking for. I tracked down other people who saw Deviney too. How are you two doing today? It's hard not to get so far, noticed so inside the local watering hole in Seaside. Security footage shows suspected kidnapper Russell Deviney sitting at a table Tuesday night in the U Street pub. Bartender Julie Camberg paid attention. He didn't do anything strange. He, um... He had a backpack and like a tied together black garbage bag kind of. Camberg even remembers Deviney's order. He ordered a cup of chowder and two Mountain Dews. And Deviney approached the counter with other customers. That's when something clicked in Camberg's mind. So I was watching Facebook at midnight and a half asleep. And the next night, like what was that, would have been 22 hours later, I remembered what I was looking at. But she second guessed herself because Deviney had changed his appearance a bit. His hair was shaved, his mustache was shaved, he had a beanie on, he wasn't wearing glasses. She called police anyway and gave them a solid lead tracking his move from this McDonald's restaurant north in Astoria the day before. This is also the spot where the 15-year-old girl Deviney is accused of kidnapping regained her freedom. Employees told me Deviney walked away from the parking lot and the girl ran inside and asked for help. Back in Seaside, Julie Camberg can't believe what's happened. It's very scary that people like that are out there that will do such things. And, and this restaurant is done with dealing with suspects on the run. That girl was reunited with her family earlier this week. Deviney is facing charges ranging from sex abuse to coercion. He's due in court tomorrow afternoon. In Cannon Beach, Hillary Lake, K2 News. On your side, investigator Hillary Lake joins us live. And Hillary, why are shootings spilling across the river? Well, Deb, police have discovered that some gang members have family in Portland, so they head out of state to lay low. The city itself lures other gang members out of Portland. Officers are on alert, and so is one woman who's pushed gang violence out of her neighborhood. This past year has been way better. Cynthia Powers lives in Vancouver's Maplewood neighborhood. You'd never know a few years ago it was a hotbed for gang activity. What are some of the things that you guys have done to clean it up? Um, one of the things is just being vigilant and watching and reporting what we see. These days, she still watches her street, but she's also keeping an eye on what's happening several miles away in Portland. Quite often when a lot of things go on over there, it drifts over here and that gets a little scary. An undercover detective with the Vancouver Police Gang Unit tells me that's exactly what's happening. What does the public need to know going into the summer? That we have a gang presence in Vancouver, Clark County. We know that Portland has an effect on what we see over in Vancouver. He says nine shootings with ties to Portland gangs have occurred in Vancouver in the past year. Downtown nightclubs are big attractions. And in six more cases, police found witnesses, victims, or suspects from gang shootings in Portland in Vancouver. This guy, A.D. Bailey III, was arrested at his parents' home in Vancouver last month. Investigators believe he shot a man at 182nd and Division last October. And you have a prediction. That we will, before the summer is over, we will see at least a couple more shootings in Vancouver. And Cynthia so Powers knows he's probably right. And she encourages people to protect their neighborhoods and get involved. All we can do is stay vigilant and hope that it doesn't happen. And much like Portland, the Portland Police Bureau is adding six officers to its gang unit for the summer, the Vancouver Police Department is also adding more officers to patrol the downtown area and the city's waterfront parks. Live in North Portland, Hillary Lake, K2 News. Hillary, thank you. We have wildfire season team coverage for you. Dave Seleski is here with why the slightly cooler weather did not really help firefighters today. But we start with Hillary Lake, just back from the gorge, where two homes burned down yesterday with some amazing video of an unexpected reunion you'll see only on K2 Hillary. 
Well, this is one of those stories that doesn't just seem possible after something so devastating like losing a home in a wildfire, and it helps put what's important in life into perspective. A peaceful rhythm created by the fury of fire. We lost everything. We came out of here with a car and the clothes we had on. Connie Thurston is haunted by nearly not making it out of her home, perched above Biggs Junction during Wednesday's wildfire. We didn't hear anything. We didn't smell smoke, um, didn't see anything. Got to the front door and opened it. It sounded like a huge train coming through. She showed me the mess Thursday evening, remembering how she and her husband scrambled to get their two and a half year old granddaughter to safety. I grabbed her hand and we walked out through this back door. And I didn't know for sure if we were gonna make the car. Connie also saved her five dogs, but a sixth dog disappeared. Our camera spotted a scared cinnamon early Thursday morning, proof she's alive. Don't give up hope. Connie, There's who survived wow. brain surgery and is waiting for a kidney transplant, spent all day searching for her pal, her thin voice fighting the powerful wind. And by some miracle, more than 24 hours later, just as she was getting ready to leave the property, with our cameras rolling, she oh, sees Cinnamon. We got her. In the midst of devastation, they find comfort in each other. Just so glad she's here. She looks as relieved as you are. <laughs> you can't believe how elated I am that she's back. And the Red Cross is putting Connie, her husband, and their dogs up in a hotel until Saturday. They don't have renter's insurance. After that, they don't know where they'll go. Her daughter, Kimberly, has set up a GoFundMe account to help raise money to get her parents reestablished. Hillary Lake, K2 News. An investigator's exclusive. Federal agents learned a convicted bank robber from Seattle possibly built a secret bunker on a farm in northwest Portland. It really is part of a bizarre case spanning several western states. On your side, investigator Hillary Lake joins us live. And Hillary, they invited you along for the search for the hidden stash. Well, that's right. And it was a hunt, really, for things police call treasures, a bad guy's belongings that help explain how he managed to live off the grid for a long, long time. That is, until his luck ran out. All these are, are, are shorthorn. Um, that's the breed. It's where urban meets rural. Not all these cows are dairy cows. Some of these are on a beef herd. Scott Reed's vast farm tucked away on the outskirts of northwest Portland. I want to build one house on 84 acres. I've been working on it for two years. Reed thought he knew every nook and cranny of his land until... Oh, we got a call from an agent with the ATF. With quite a story. And we had a potentially a bank robber stash on our uh, property. Yeah, way up at the top there in those big... Back in those big trees. It's disconcerting. Nobody wants that on their place, that's for sure. Federal investigators got a tip that Bradley Robinette, who'd already been convicted of robbing a bank in Seattle in 1998 and was a fugitive on the run, handpicked Scott Reed's property as a secret hiding spot. He's a loner, he's a survivalist. John Hansen's the special agent from ATF who called Reed. Let's go, Ellie. Come on. All right, let's go see what we can find. He brought a team from Seattle to Portland. Good girl. Let's find it. Where's it at? To search the farm for Robinette's stash. Let's find it. Only K2's camera joined the hunt. Show me. Whoa! Yeah! What'd you find? Nice work, Ellie. Oh, boy. That a girl. <laughs> Yeah, there's one there. There's one. They found the stash <laughs> off the beaten path, buried deep under a canopy of trees. Well, two for sure, maybe a third one. In. Large cases covered in camouflage, holding some of Robinette's secrets. Is there something down below it? What is a shovel, a knife? Machete? There's a toolkit in here, camping gear in here. All things uh, a man on the run might need to live undetected. Robinette did several years in an Arizona federal prison for that bank robbery before getting out in 2009 to supervised release. That's when he went on the lam, evading police for nearly five years. 
But last June, Robinette met his match hundreds of miles away in this parking lot in Hillsboro. It was a good day. Rookie officer Matt Schmidt was driving a police cruiser with a license plate reader. Three quarters of the way down, close to the door, and it just goes nuts saying that we have stolen plates. To have dispatch come out and say, hey, he's got federal warrants out of a bunch of different states, and um, it's pretty pretty exciting. Robinette pled guilty to several federal escape charges in January. His arrest in Hillsboro eventually led Special Agent Hansen to an underground bunker in Sammamish, Washington. Robinette apparently built it and occasionally lived there. Very physically fit. Uh, he's a good planner, very well organized. That's what led Hansen and his team back here to Reed's farm near Portland. What we'll do is we'll carry all this stuff up to the top of the hill. Well, I will skip the gym tonight. Yep. This will do. Investigators unpacked the hidden stash at the Hillsboro Police Department. Here we go. And load. Oh, this one is loaded. Got five rounds. It's got good taste. Three stolen guns with a treasure trove of other military type items. Well, lots of knives. He loves knives. Almost as much as guns. Here's a gas mask. Holy moly. That's better than the one ATF gave me. Wow. Ready made burglary kit. Then there's this a real samurai sword. So I'd hate for somebody who's hiking in the woods to come across it and uh, harm themselves. Hansen uh, doesn't know what led Robinette to the farm in the first place. He doesn't have any family or friends nearby. It's a mystery that's part of the history of Scott Reed's property. Sort of a strange feeling. Even though Robinette's case is closed. We just wanted to make sure that the neighbors knew that we didn't have anything to do with the ATF and FBI digging around the property. And investigators believe Bradley Robinette has a third stash buried in the Pacific Northwest. They plan to go search for it in May. That's also the same month Robinette gets sentenced on those escape charges, and he's looking at close to 12 years in prison. He certainly was a planner, wow. wasn't Definitely. he? Definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Hillary. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Hillary, thank you. How are you today? Good, you? Pretty good. They're the sounds you hear in every restaurant in America. There you go, Bob. On most days. Lindsay will have to ring you up, okay? But there are moments when a roar <laughs> drowns them out at the Cornerstone Cafe in Rainier, putting the town on notice. Mark Overbay is the owner. I mean, they stand like, you know, like 20 feet in the air. I mean, it just fills up, you can't see nothing except the top of the building on the other side. The restaurant, like every business on A Street, sits just feet from the tracks. The main thoroughfare for mile-long trains carrying crude oil from North Dakota along Highway 30 to a transfer station in Klatskanai. What are you concerned about happening here? Uh, a derailment and uh, an explosion. It could take out a just whole downtown area. I think they're rolling bombs, really. And if it happens, it might not be an accident. I, I just want to direct your attention to the issue, not of accidents for a moment, but to, uh, to terrorism. In February, New York Representative Sean Maloney questioned rail and oil representatives at a House hearing in Washington, D.C. He compared train security to pre-9-11 airplane security. What concerns me very much is the possibility that an oil train could be similarly um, taken and directed and used as a weapon of mass destruction. Um, is that coming over here? I don't know. It's real hot. How would anyone know in time? How would anyone prevent it? I, uh, I and they could do it where and, and when they wanted. The scariest part of that question? We already know the answer. We won't know in time because attacks like what Maloney is describing are already happening just on a much smaller scale and right here in Oregon. In 2011, a train car derailed in Coos Bay after someone sabotaged a section of track, causing $20,000 in damage. It happened again in Bend. That incident caused a fuel tank to spill 2,000 gallons of diesel. South Dakota, Virginia, Montana, Oklahoma, the list of intentional derailments goes on. 
and all of them happened after Congress passed the 9-11 Act of 2007. That required the Department of Homeland Security to assess risk on the nation's rail lines and create a plan to improve security of things like railroad lines, rail yards, bridges and tunnels. But Homeland Security hasn't followed the plan all the way through, so you have no idea if the tracks are secure or not. But we do. The On Your Side investigators took a first-hand look at the security of train yards around the state, like this one in Northwest Portland. The only thing keeping me out of this yard is this sign. Security non-existent. And how about this refinery up Highway 30 in Klatskanai? Its most obvious entrance is guarded, but we discovered access to the pipes and the trains isn't totally secure. This is the end of the line for those westbound oil trains, a ship to shore transfer center. We wanted to see how close we could get if there were a train here. We haven't seen any security cameras or fences. We were able to just walk in. It's the same story at rail lines throughout Oregon and Washington. Small communities like Rainier built up along the tracks facing the most risk. Never know. It's kind of like uh, playing craps. You don't know when it's going to come up double zeros, you know. <laughs> and as K2's Hillary Lake details in this exclusive report now, the governor do much more than he's led you to believe. That was The Dream, an easy access website that would elevate Oregon to rock star status in the world of universal health care. Cover Oregon is a new online marketplace starting this October. The Will state chose to go on its own when the Affordable Health Care Act became federal law in 2010. And who could blame them? I'm very, very pleased with where we are today. Governor Kitzhaber is an emergency room doctor. His track record on health care reform demanded nothing less than Oregon setting the bar for the rest of the country. He would build a health insurance exchange that would be his legacy. Well, they were just diving in. It was like trying to paint a car that's already moving instead of making sure that everything's done before you start moving ahead. Now Oregon and the rest of the nation are realizing that car was headed for a crash. And Governor Kitzhaber claims he didn't know it until the very month people should have started signing up for health insurance on the Cover Oregon website. Well, I knew about the problems uh, in late October is when I first learned about the problems. Sound implausible? It does to critics now, and it has to Republican Representative Dennis Richardson for months. Richardson was the co-chair of the state legislature's Ways and Means Committee back when all this started, in charge of monitoring Oregon's finances. When the state told him it wanted to take $48 million from the feds to build a health care exchange, he insisted on some conditions. And I said, okay, then I will only approve, my, my part of this approval will only happen if they agree to all of those things so that we can get proper oversight and they will cooperate with the legislative ability to do oversight. Representative Julie Parrish, also a Republican, tells me she gave the same ultimatum. She was on the Legislative Health Care Committee tasked with deciding whether the project was good for Oregonians. They came back and said, "Is you know, we'll work with and get some oversight in that piece. So that was in between so they made 2011. Promises to you oh, absolutely. Uh, they promised that it wouldn't take state money, that it, it would have oversight, that the governor's office would be um, very involved in this. By the end of 2011, those promises started taking shape. The state developed a structure of oversight that directly involved the governor's office. It required quality assurance reports to be delivered to the governor's office from three different sources. The Cover Oregon Board of Directors, who Governor Kitzhaber himself appointed, a joint oversight committee made up of Cover Oregon managers and the Oregon Health Authority, including its director, Dr. Bruce Goldberg, and the Department of Administrative Services. That's the agency that's responsible for making sure all other state agencies are following the rules and keeping to their budgets. The state also hired a company called Maximus to do monthly and quarterly quality assurance reports, which again, according to the oversight chart, all went directly to Governor Kitzhaber's office. Maximus completed nearly two dozen reports over a two-year span. And from the start, they were dire. 
every one classified the scope and schedule of the project as high risk, as indicated by these red boxes like the red warning lights on your car's dashboard, demanding immediate attention for a repair. Not enough staff, no deadlines, and a goal that was too ambitious to meet an October 1, 2013 go-live date for the Cover Oregon website to start enrolling people. For example, this report, dated September 15, 2012, reads as if Cover Oregon is taking one step forward and two steps back. It says, quote, the organization has made significant progress in a number of areas, including getting a better handle on all those project risks. But it also says, quote, while there was important progress made, a full month has gone by since the initial risk assessment was completed and progress was not considered significant enough to lower the overall risk of the endeavor. Representative Richardson had seen enough. Not convinced the people in charge of the Cover Oregon website were paying attention to those Maximus reports, he took matters into his own hands. So I drafted a letter on the 17th of September and sent it to all of them and said, you need to take this seriously. Here is a copy of the, the QA's report that indicates what a crisis situation that we're in, and this needs to be rectified now. The them was Senator Richard Devlin and Representative Peter Buckley, both Democrats and co-chair of the Ways and Means Committee, along with Richardson. The email also went to four members of the nonpartisan Legislative Fiscal Office, a member of the House Minority Office, the chiefs of staff for both the House co-speaker and the Senate president, and to Dave Dodderer, the budget coordinator for the House and the Senate. And since the state had promised Richardson oversight all those months ago, Richardson also sent the email directly to Governor Kitzhaber. Why did you blind copy the governor? Well, at that point, I wanted him to be aware that this was, that I was notifying his people, but I didn't want them to feel intimidated at that point, but he needed to know. What was the reaction that you got from the governor's office after that initial email? I didn't get any initially. Nothing. Nothing. Crickets. That's right. Three days later, on September 20th, 2012, Richardson sent a second email, this time directly to the governor and only the governor. He attached this Maximus report with 11 of 19 categories still marked in red for high risk. Richardson says Kitzhaber didn't respond right away, so he called his office to talk about it. A few days later, he says the governor returned the call. He said, I, no, I understand uh, that, you know, that you're concerned. You need to trust the team. I said, Governor, let me remind you, if this was your money, and then your quality assurance team came in and said, this project is in jeopardy, you wouldn't say, just trust those that I picked to run the project. I'm joined now by K2's Hillary Lake. And Hillary, I'm sure a lot of folks at home wondering, how do we know this call actually took place? Well, both Richardson and the governor's office told us that the phone lines at the Capitol are purged every 100 days, so there wouldn't be a record of that call taking place by now anyway. What about the governor's calendar? Because you would assume there'd be something on there indicating that call took place. Right, and we asked the governor's office for his calendar uh, during this time in September 2012. This is what they sent us. Uh, pages, they, there is no record of a phone call with Representative Richardson, but there is some blacked out information and we asked his office to prove to us if that information is confidential because they blacked it out and they told us that they couldn't prove that to us. So it's anybody's guess what is underneath that black. So we dug up a witness to the phone call. The, what was the reaction that you got from the governor's office after that initial email? I didn't get any initially. Nothing. Crickets. That's right. It was September 2012, and Representative Dennis Richardson hadn't just sent one email to Governor Kitzhaber about Cover Oregon's problems. He'd sent a second email days later, directly to the governor and only the governor, containing dire warnings about the project. Then came the phone call. Remember Dave Dodderer, the budget coordinator for the legislature, who also got Richardson's first red flag email? He tells K2 News he was in Richardson's office when Governor Kitzhaber called to finally talk about Richardson's Cover Oregon concerns. What were they talking about? Well, what uh, um, the governor was calling uh, Representative Richardson back and was calling him about that, about the issue, uh, about the Uncover Oregon. And I rem remember Representative Richardson walking th him through what his concerns were uh, about the quality assurance report and what he was hearing from uh, the legislative staff and what the various issues were. And then there's this, an email dated September 22, 2012, from the guy in charge of it all, Dr. Bruce Goldberg. 
Goldberg was the head of the Oregon Health Authority and a Cover Oregon board member appointed by the governor. Goldberg wrote to Representative Richardson, quote, I have discussed with the governor's office this morning. Did you press Bruce Goldberg on this again after you sent him that email and got that response back? I talked to him from time to time and he said, you know, we're, we're working on it. The thing that I feared most that was going to happen is exactly what happened. And that thing Representative Richardson feared was that the website wouldn't work at all, and it still doesn't. And Hillary, critics will say Richardson only came forward with this information, these emails, because he is gunning for Governor Kitzhaber's job. Well, that's right, Steve. And Representative Richardson was also running for governor back then when he sent those emails initially, just like he is now. Even Richardson knows, though, it's logical for people to think he has an agenda here. Right, and he would be one of the first people to admit that, but he cites the legislature's overwhelming bipartisan support of the state health care uh, exchange, at which he ultimately voted yes for. Stick around. we got much more to talk about, Hillary. We are not done with this story uh, quite yet.